So thanks for coming to this session. Um, we're going to be talking about empowering human services a data through NYC's budget, a data journey through NYC's budget. Um, thanks to the School of Data for putting on this event. Uh, my name is Brad Martin. I'll be joined by my colleagues Emily Pisano and Zoe Liu. Um, we are from FPWA um, and we're going to be presenting uh, what we call the NYC Funds Tracker. So the NYC Funds Tracker is an interactive data dashboard that we've created using open data and it allows you to um, explore the city budget. Um, it's something that we've made primarily for human services advocates, um, since that's uh, the majority of people that we work with, but I think there'll be uses that um, anyone can get from it as well. And we're gonna have some cats to help us get through it because I know it's 2.30 after lunch on a Saturday, so um, they're gonna help us <laughs> stay on track. Uh, in terms of the presentation today, um, I'm going to give a bit of um, background and context about um, what's led us to uh, create the tracker and, and a bit about the budget. Um, Emily is going to give a live demo of the funds tracker. And then, of course, since it's a school of data, Zoe will take us behind the scenes and um, talk about how we access the data and how you can use the data yourself for your own needs as well. And then um, we'll have time at the end for any questions and answers. So just a bit about FPWA. Um, we are an anti-poverty policy and advocacy organization. Uh, we're focused really on New York City, but also um, do work that has some state and federal impacts. Um, we have over 170 members. That includes religious, non-religious, um, community-based organizations, but all primarily working in the human services space. Um, so our work ranges across all of human services, really. Any, any work that has um, an impact on improving the lives of New Yorkers with low incomes. Um, in terms of um, the team here today, we are our small little fiscal policy team. So we do a lot of economic analysis, um, research, and a big chunk of our work is focused on looking at the budget, which is what we'll be talking a lot about today. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> there was meant to be a uh, interactive part here, but <laughs> instead, um, I don't know if anyone wants to just share any, um, no pressure to, but if anyone wants to share like how familiar you are with NYC's budget and budget advocacy or I don't know, getting a sense of who's in the room today. Um, yeah, I don't, well, you don't need to worry if you're not really familiar because I'll explain it a bit. So, <laughs> um, so uh, New York City's budget is um, bigger than all but a handful of states. So it's about $100 billion um, every year, um, you know, at its, most basic, it, the city budget tells um, how the city is going to raise revenue, so who, who it's going to tax, how much money the city is going to get from federal and state government, and then it outlines how it's going to spend its money. So um, looking at if it's going to spend money on, you know, schools, sanitation, um, you know, pretty much anything that the city does. Um, so the... Office of Management and Budget is the agent, the city agency that's responsible for preparing the budget, um, and that's headed up by the budget director, Jacques Jiha, who's the person on the slide there next to Mayor Adams. Um, and, you know, the process of making the budget is really underway at the moment, so um, the budget needs to be passed by June 30. So, um, as I said, the um, the budget for the next fiscal year is being negotiated at the moment. Um, we feel it's a really important time to be involved in budget advocacy. Um, if you've been looking at the news, you might have seen some of the um, headlines and um, comments from the mayor about um, budget cuts and you know the fiscal state that the city is in, um, and particularly the mayor um, pointing to the cost of supporting asylum seekers for the reason. Um, of that, of the current situation. Um, 
since since um, the mayor first announced uh, some budget cuts, um, some of these have been reversed, but a lot of them are still standing. So um, some of the high profile ones that are still being talked about are around the libraries. Um, people are concerned that they might need to be closing on the weekends. And so um, what we're hearing from our members is that they're you know, a little worried about the current discourse around the budget and um, they're wanting to know how they can get involved. Um, again, <laughs> if anyone has any thoughts they want to share about how you're feeling about the current budget season, feel free to, um, but no pressure. <laughs> I mean, for us, we're um, obviously representing human services agencies. We're really concerned about any cuts to human services. Um, and one of the one of the other things that um, you'll see in the tracker is that, and you've, you hear a little bit about it in some of the discussions that are happening around the budget, is the amount of um, federal and state funding that's coming to the city um, and how we can understand um, what's going on there. As some of our key focuses at the moment. And so obviously since, um, you know, the city is working with limited resources. A lot of groups will try to influence the budget. So, um, as I've said, you know, we're trying to ad advocate for human services agencies, but there's, you know, a lot of different other lobbyists, um, businesses, nonprofits that try to do this as well. Um, the thing, the main constant is that when you're advocating in the budget, you need to have the data and information. Um, to make, to make the case that you want to make. And so on that point of data and information, um, one of the things that we've heard from our members is that they know that there's information out there, but it's, um, you know, a bit overwhelming at times. So there's, you know, if you want to understand um, the city's finances, you can look at the annual comprehensive financial report, but that's like a big 500 page document that's not particularly accessible. Um, thankfully, the Comptroller has created Checkbook NYC, which does provide a massive amount of information, um, you know, open data that people can access. Um, but even that is because there's so much information there, it can be hard for um, people engaging in uh, human services advocacy to know where to look. Um, but the good thing is that that, um, that data is available. So. There is, um, so there is a lot of information out there, but it's, you know, overwhelming. And so that's what led us to create our NYC Funds Tracker. So the NYC Funds Tracker is an interactive dashboard. Um, it's live now on our website. Um, what it does is it looks at all of the different revenue sources from the city. Um, so it looks at how the city generates generates revenue through taxes, but also through federal and state grants. Um, one of the things that we've heard from our members is that, um, you know, sometimes depending on the program that they're operating, they're not sure if it's going to be, you know, federal, city or state. So we um, show that breakdown and allow you to go into the detail, which Emily will show you in a bit. Um, and then we also look at the budget expenditure side. So given the revenue that the city generates, we look at how the city um, is spending it. So we're, we're looking at not just like the size of the pie or the size of the pizza, um, but you know, how it's divided as well. Um, so now before we jump into the demo, I'll just um, you know, talk a bit more about what the tracker is and what it isn't. Um, probably one of the main things to note is that it looks at what has actually happened. So we take the um, actual budget information from um, the Comptroller and it looks backwards um, over 10 years. So it allows you to understand the trends in funding over time. Um, and you know, then on the flip side of that, it's not something that's making any forecasts or looking to the future. So it's more like a tool that you would use to understand the context of where we are now rather than um, directly looking at the budget that the city is preparing. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, this is like the first iteration of this that we've made, but um, you know, over the next year, we're going to be talking to different people and you know, keen to hear from any of you if you've um, had a look at it. 
um, any feedback and we're going to continue to update it over the next year. So I think with that now, I'll hand over to Emily, who's going to show you the tracker. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Emily. I'm also a fiscal policy analyst at FPWA. I'm just going to get into a demo of the tool and kind of get into a case study of why uh, the historical budget context is really important to the current moment that we're in um, and how you can leverage this tool or share it with people that are maybe less, you know, have less expertise in the budget um, to empower them to do their own research so that we can, you know, kind of gather everyone's diverse perspectives. Um, and you know, start a conversation that more people feel like they can engage in. Um, I'm just going to go to our actual web page so you can see it. So this is hosted on FPWA's website. Um, so you can feel free to access it here um, and start a little demo. So um, right now, what you're seeing is the landing page for um, the New York City Funds Tracker dashboard. Um, and as, what this, uh, da this landing page shows is the last full fiscal year um, of New York City budget. So that's actually fiscal year 23 um, because we're still in fiscal year 24. Um, you see here on the left, we've kind of, or as Brad touched on, trying to show you know, where the budget comes from, uh, where the money comes from, and then where the budget goes. Um, so on the left here, you can see a breakdown of city, uh, New York City revenue, uh, with the largest source being taxes. Um, sorry, refreshing. Um, that's fine. Uh, with the largest source being taxes, um, followed by state grants and federal grants, um, and then a number of sort of miscellaneous uh, city uh, funds, so charges for services, fines and forfeitures, um, and non-governmental grants, etc. Um, but these make up a much smaller portion of the budget, which you'll be able to see when we go into those more specific views. Uh, on the right over here, we have a breakdown of budget expenditure. And so um, actually this is, we have a human services focus because we kind of wanted to move, we wanted to move the conversation towards a focus on our human services agencies, which often go underfunded and underprioritized. Um, so uh, New York City has you know, over 50 agencies that would be very overwhelming to display. Um, so right now we have eight human services agencies displayed here, as well as the Department of Education, and then other agency budgets um, listed at the top. And our idea is to, you know, do further iterations of this to expand um, our analysis of agencies so you can do more comparative views. But with the context of uh, the current budget season and uh, human services agencies getting a lot of brunt of cuts, we um, have highlighted these um, agencies. So if you look at the center, um, it shows you that there's been uh, about 108 dollar 108 billion dollars in revenue with 100 billion being spent towards our agencies um, and then that difference between revenue and budget mainly going to service debt um, so this is just the top line the 50,000 foot view of the budget um, that kind of can help you to get an initial sense but if you go to this um, uh, sidebar over here, you can access the specific views um, that can help you get a better sense of how we got to now and what choices have led to this current revenue um, breakdown and this current uh, budget expenditure breakdown. So we have a couple views over here. You can see that it's broken down by revenue, by budget, and then there's a number of resources outside of the funds tracker that are listed here that you can access. Um, I'm going to first go to revenue over time. And this is a breakdown of that left-hand bar. Um, what we can see here is there's actually a lot of different ways that you can filter the data. And you can pull this data directly from our funds tracker and use it in your own reports. Um, but you know, perhaps you want to get a sense of how revenue over time has changed. And talking about that narrative that a lot of you know, has been talked about 
in uh, the current budget cycle? You know, are we really uh, facing a tight fiscal scenario? What actually has changed in the way that we raise revenue, and how is that compared to historical trends? Um, so what you can see here is um, uh, the rev revenue has consistently gone upwards um, over, you know, we go back to 2011. That's the first year that New York City Checkbook, Checkbook NYC has data. Consistently gone upward, although we see a slowing trend here uh, for revenue. Um, and maybe you want to get into context of what does that mean for uh, actual spending power. You can then go to our view here called inflation adjusted, and it automatically adjusts those numbers and visualizes those numbers for you. What we do see is actually there has been a decline in revenue that's being collected by the city. Um, and we might want to understand, OK, what is, um, why has there been a decline in revenue? You can see here that there has been a decline a downward movement in grants, which, as we talked about, is a major portion of the budget. But if we want to get a better sense of that, we might want to go to the line graph view instead of the stacked view. And we can see here, OK, COVID, removal of COVID funding, federal grants have dropped precipitously. Um, and even in 2023, it's at uh, about $10 billion. You can see here in this little tooltip uh, where you would, it's actually was higher federal grants in 2011. So interesting to kind of have that narrative of, oh, well, the federal government has been giving so much money. Um, what, you, uh, now we need to unwind all those benefits. Well, if you look past, to the past, it was actually higher. Um, so moving from this, we can kind of understand with this drop in federal grants, um, how does that affect the composition of the budget? And so this is like budget wonky stuff, but we want to know what the composition of the budget is because we want to know how different players in the budget scene are feeling about, um, about where they need to make up money. And what we can see here is that the New York City government has had to fund a larger portion of their services and operations. So you can see, you can select that here. Um, moving on, we would then, if we were talking about revenue over time, uh, we'd want to move to budget expenditure over time. So we know where the money comes from, now where does it go? And what choices have been made there? Navigating again to the, this budget expenditure time over time, we can see a similar view. And um, again, we might want to go to that stacked area graph. And we can see that, again, budget expenditure has generally gone up over time, although there's been more of those like uh, troughs, I would say, in how it's being allocated. Um, again, understanding what does that mean look like for inflation-adjusted numbers, we do see that there is a drop in how much the, that there's been a decrease in budget expenditure, which might be expected with revenue going down. Um, but you perhaps maybe you'd want to understand, OK, I see that budget, it, you know, revenue is going down. I guess I'd assume uh, budget expenditure is going down. But how do they move together? And that's kind of um, one of the things that we want to get into. I just want to highlight first, though, uh, within this, that you have the option to select specific agencies that you might want to you might be interested in. So throughout this presentation, I'll be doing a focus on DSS, so Department of Social Services, um, because that is one of the largest human services agencies and administers a lot of. Um, so we could we might want to look at okay, how has Department of Social S Services funding changed over time? And interestingly, you do see a decrease or a declining trend in the amount of money that is going to the Department of Social Services, which is pretty powerful when we're thinking about um, changing uh, landscapes, um, social landscapes. Anyway, so going back to that comparison of revenue versus budget over time, we can look at the growth rates. This is the shifting growth rates in revenue and budget expenditure. Um, so what you can see here is the default view is to look at kind of all agency funding for the city. And as you'd expect here, the orange line is budget expenditure. And here is um, revenue, uh, 
And as you can see, they generally move in tandem, which is, again, what you would expect. But we want to know about priorities. How is the city changing its priorities in the city? How is it spending that, um, that budget? How is it spending the revenue that's collected? And what are those choices that it's making? So we could first remove uh, other agencies if we want to think about the human services landscape. And we start to see a differing trend here. So before expenditure was actually, there was, this is basically the growth rate. And so how much more the city has, is committing to budget expenditure, or how much more are these things growing? Uh, as we see, there's an upward trend. So the growth, um, we can see that uh, human services agencies have had less funding um, or had less growth than the budget, the revenue. If we wanted to then kind of think about it, again, with a specific example, DSS, we see a extremely different, a, a more drastic uh, trend. And we can actually see that they, it's been consistently deprioritized. So speaking to that view of what we saw in budget expenditure. Um, from there, uh, you could also, from there, you know, we might want to understand, OK, what are the elements that are affecting its, uh, its expenditure? How are, um, how can we influence this to change that trend? Um, and as we talked about earlier, as we touched on, grant funding is a, uh, has been a major impact on New York City's budget, specifically from the federal um, level. So we might want to click into this grant view. This grant view gives you an overview of all the grants that are coming into of human service grants that are coming into the city's budget. So this is a, we have a couple of different views here that you can play around with. Um, this line, this gray line shows uh, the trend of, or the amount of grants that are being pushed in or pulled into the city's budget. Uh, you can see there's obviously a spike for COVID and statewide. Um, but interestingly, while you see a spike here, there's been the, not the same growth in uh, social services. So if you want to take that as an example. Um, another view that we can see here to kind of compare the amount of grant that's coming in, grants that are coming in, um, is through this state versus federal grant. And you can see that um, generally the state um, the state provides about double the amount of grants than the federal level. Um, but if you go to Department of, and it's been generally stable, or but if you go to the Department of Social Services, you can see that actually, again, grant funding has been decreasing from both um, the federal level and the state level, with actually much more of those grants coming from the federal level. Um, OK, so we now know that the federal, federal grants have been decreasing. And that might be an area that we now have identified as an advocacy area. Um, we then maybe want to identify what specifically is influencing this trend in grants. And that's where you can go to our top grants view. And the top grant view, um, just this is, you can uh, see right here, we still have the selection of Department of Social Services, shows the top five grants that are being pulled into the Department of Social Services. Um, and you can see here that there's obviously been a major um, uh, trend downwards in uh, grants, uh, specifically in this green line, which is the TANF grant or temporary assistance for needy families. Um, and I think you, know, you can come from this perspective. There's a lot of ways to use our tool. So maybe you were specifically interested in TAMF grants already, depending on your advocacy. And you could kind of come backwards. Um, or you really are doing an exploratory view. And like us, we you know, want to do a research project into, OK, why have TAMF grants? What are the forces that have changed why TAMF, TAMF Temporary assistance <laughs> um, has gone downwards so much. So I think this is where I'll move into kind of a case study of TAMF and how advocates can use these or think about these research questions um, to empower their own advocacy. 
now we're kind of thinking about we saw that major downward trend. We want to understand what's going on uh, with TANF grants and what we should do about it. So the New York City Funds Tracker gives you that funding landscape. Um, and we want to, it's been able to tell us which grants have changed. And now we have to provide the context of what do they fund and why was this funding altered. We then can give our own uh, you know, context of the impact. And then from understanding the impact to New York City, move to advocacy steps. Um, I, just a little uh, kind of background on TAMP funding, if you aren't familiar. Uh, temporary assistance for needy fa uh, families is a federal block grant program. And it's the large, largest assistance program for families. Um, its purpose is to reduce dependency on uh, on welfare, it was started in 1996 in that reform era. So when, you know, under the Clinton administration, its goal notably is not to reduce poverty, but to reduce welfare roles. Um, so it kind of lives in that space of very uh, pejorative kind of uh, welfare queen, like a lot of these rhetoric around how he talked about um, assistance. Um, there's strict eligibility requirements there, and um, it has actually been capped to the 1996 level because their purpose was to reduce assistance. So it's not inflation adjusted. Um, these funds are specifically designed to move downwards. Um, because of this, there's also a state program called the Safety Net Assistance, which supplements TAMF funding. And so the... What we can see here is we're not going to get into all of the details, um, but through the funds tracker, you can through this visualization, you can kind of help um, identify the major shifts and pair that with policy knowledge. So filling in your gaps together. So we can see a couple of inflection points um, in our in the graph movement, and notably, what you see is in twenty. Uh, after in the pandemic era, after 2019, you can see there's a precipitous fall in TAMP funding and uh, that it remains depressed, that this funding has not gone down, uh, not gone back up. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, there's, they've, uh, there's stimulus uh, changes in how, you know, with stimulus checks, um, accounting that into how they um, generally uh, calculate who gets, uh, who qualifies for TAMF, um, but also the state just allocating this TAMF funding, uh, failing to allocate this money to the city. So what does the impact of this, what is the impact of this? And what we can see is that direct assistance has gone downwards. Um, the funds tracker shows through that view that it's been a 32% decline in the amount of TAMP funding that the city is receiving. And that directly translates into fewer families receiving assistance. So this is 2020 levels. Um, basically, uh, for every 100 families living in poverty, only 21 of those families are receiving um, assistance. And that's prior to this downward trend. And we know that despite uh, that while cash assistance has decreased, poverty rates remain, are actually elevated. So in New York, we see the poor getting poorer, which is actually different from, uh, you know, different city trends. Um, and our own members have can speak to this experience. So we pair our lived experience with the data. And one of our uh, interview with a woman talking about her uh, experience with cash assistance, which is administered through TAMF, um, she basically gets $300 a month, which, as we know, is not enough to even buy a Metro card in the city. So she's raising a three-year-old daughter. Um, she doesn't even, even with food stamps, she, has, she doesn't have enough money to cover um, her costs. She can't survive off of it. And so combining these, all these data points together, we have identified a, essentially the need for systematic change. You know, we can't talk about just um, 
we need to combine the data with our human, like the human experience to empower advocacy um, and to talk about all those different pieces that have affected why New Yorkers are getting less. Um, we've used this, you know, it informs our own testimony and it also has informed different networks that FPWA uh, supports. So Cash Assistance Reform Network, which advocates for um, increasing, changing those formulas um, that have resulted in New York getting less money and changing um, the way that it, the state is allocating money to the city. Um, we have, this is just one case study, um, but there's a lot of different ways that you can use this data, obviously. Um, we have a funds tracker report, which you can kind of, you can dive into, and this highlights sector-wide um, funding for the human services sector, um, but we encourage everyone here who has very different backgrounds to do their own case studies and to leverage the data in the ways that they um, find useful. I'm going to pass it over now to Zoe, who's going to talk about making the tracker and how some of our data tools can help empower your own work. Um, thanks, Emily. Uh, I'm Zoe. And uh, this is our last part behind the scene. And I will briefly introduce how our team made our tracker. Um, as Brian mentioned earlier, our data source is Checkbook NYC. And this is a um, data um, data transparency tool that released by the controller's office that contains the budget and spending the revenue information for the entire city. So for our side, we mainly use the data from its budget and revenue section. And if you, you know, if you want to know more about its data structure and the detailed information, you can click the data feed button on its main page. For our data, our data spans from fiscal year 11 to fiscal year 23. We have a special attention, we focus more on the human services agency in New York City. And for, and you can see the full name for all the agencies we include below. So we, our first step is to use API calls to collect the raw data. API call is a medium for programs to interact with each other, and the controller's office allow users to request access to the web server to retrieve their data. So you can click the website below to find more information about API call and its syntax. For our team, we chose to use our script to automate um, our API call and collect our raw data. This is a screenshot of our R script, and uh, we use this script to extract budgetary data for my agency from fiscal year 11 to 23. In the checkbook NYC default setting, each API call can retrieve up to 20,000 records, but in our R script, we expand this limit to 60,000 by implementing a recursive structure. So the entire script has 300 lines of code, but only three of them are important. The first important one is line 25, and this is used to specify the list of agencies. And uh, as we want to know about the nine agencies, so you can see nine numbers here. You can, um, you can see a full list of the agency codes on Checkbook NYC's web page agency code list. And the second line is line 29, and in this line we specify the, the years we want to collect. So you can see a number from 2011 to 2023. And the last line is this line 259. And, in the, and, the, and the numbers in these lines are the number of API calls we want to make. Each API call can retrieve data, can retrieve one year data for one agency, because we want to get 13 years of data. So we can see 13 in the parentheses. Um, only these three lines are important, so by modifying these three lines of code, you can get data for any agency in New York City. So it is time to make our code work for you. Let's say we want to get a physical year 17, 18, and 23 budget data for NYPD. So our first step is look at the agency code list on the right-hand side, and you can see for the police department is corresponding agency code is 056. So you put 056 in the first parenthesis. And the second and the second line, we want to get data for seven year 17, 18, and 23. So you put these three numbers in the second line. 
And the first third line, we need to count the number of agency calls we want to make, because we only want to get three year of data, so you put three in the parentheses here. So after making all of our API calls, we have got our raw data. And the next step is data merging. We merge the budget expenditure and revenue data of all human services agency across our year. And after that comes to our data cleaning part. We first delete all the NAs in our merged data, and then we standardize our data. We delete all the dollar signs, in, uh, dollar signs in the raw data, and also capitalize the first character of the program and agency name. And then we also use CPIU released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to adjust number for inflation. We also add some new columns in the existing file that include variables that are not included in our raw data, such as the total federal and the state grant received by all human services agency. And after prepare our data, we need to do data validation. We match our data with the annual comprehensive financial report. This is also released by the controller's office. And general fund information is used to validate data. And it's most relevant for advocates. Then our data is prepared, and we fill our data to Tableau and make our dashboard. Uh, we want to keep our data open, so our team constructed a GitHub repository that contains all the useful files, such as the raw textbook data, the clean data, the merge data, the code we use to extract merge and clean data, and also data validation sources. You can, clean, you can click the link below to visit it. And if you want to know more about our tracker and our index analysis, you can visit this website to get more information. And uh, we are now open for questions. Do you want to have any questions? Could you just quickly slash the GitHub address and have it? Oh, oh, here we can pull it up. Yeah. Um, to get you that site. You can also visit, if you go to actually the funds tracker, this site, um, you can see there's a link to our GitHub. So under dashboard data, if you click that, it'll get you to the uh, GitHub page. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you handle missing data and your funds off and budget data? Ah, yeah, sure. Um, so in the Chapel NYC, there is um, different sources, like it has spending data and revenue data and contracts and, and also budget. So it goes for the revenue section and it can allow you to like manually download in a CSV file and you can also use APAC call, which is more, I mean, easy to do. So yeah, you can visit Checkpoint YC and find all the data you need. Are grants always matched to like a particular agency? No. Uh, they're not always matched to a particular agency, which is why you can see that there's that big spike in COVID funding um, that's not translated to specific agencies. Um, this is like getting into the weeds, but a lot of those were held by the mayorality, um, which then was like dispersed at will, so by like the executive. Um, that is something that we're looking into pulling into our data source. But if we're kind of coming from the perspective of looking at like the sustainability of uh, our agencies themselves, um, so there's some more analysis that can be done there, but um, still there's, there's, it's a relevant context to just have the agency level. And that was particularly the case for a lot of the funding the city received throughout COVID, the emergency funding from the federal government, which had a bit more flexibility in a lot of cases, and the city sort of, you know, used it for things that were even ongoing programs, and now that's like one of the issues the city's facing is that um, the city used that funding even for funding schools, and now that funding's expiring, and it's um, sort of led to this situation we're in now where, um, you know, the man's looking at cuts and, you know, trying to work out the best way to fund these things or um, if they will continue. And like, for example, with like TAMP funding through DSS, 
like that is specifically run by that agent. It, they have specific funding that they, programs that they fund through TAMF. So it's matched there. Um, so t if you look at the specific grant view, that will be, um, will give you the information on how those programs are being funded. Have you found any departments that let you figure out how they're spending money within the department such that they can be joined? Or is that part really less transparent than the top level city budget? Yeah, I think that's probably like the next step of where we want to take this, like looking at, um, you know, going beyond um, the money going to that government department, then looking at how they spend it and looking at like contract information. Um, I think it's like a data source that we're still learning about ourselves, um, but talking to our members, that's something that they're certainly interested in as well. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, for a lot of um, our members, like while they are concerned about like the level of funding that Department of Social Services gets, like they're more interested in actually then how DSS is using that funding and how much that funding is going to them or to you know, other agencies or um, yeah, what they're spending in them. So maybe um, for next year's update, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, what is interesting is that like that becomes, I think data, uh, Zoe can talk to this a lot, is that becomes very, um, it's actually very involved in trying to break down that spending. Um, it lives in different sources. So for example, like grants, you might think of that as like <coughs> expenditure, right? But it's actually revenue because it's the money that's being pulled in through uh, New York City's uh, budget. So it, it lives in two different spaces, which is why that this work is, it might seem easy to think about where the money comes from, where the money goes, but it's obviously, it's a very complex um, puzzle piece to put together. Um, I think there was a question. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna ask if the data exists, um, the, the, the double click into the agencies, whether or not it's even available in the checkbook, but it sounds like it's just dispersed. There's some, I think, you know, that's sort of some of the questions about program funding. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to talk to that, like the specific lines per agency. Like, you know, do you do you have like more context there? Um, no, no. Well, I okay. think a lot of it is um, through a different data source, um, passport. And so, so like for example, like there's contract data, which is so we're looking at human services. And human, a lot of human services funding comes uh, through contracts. So basically, they have a, a contract. Each agency has a contract budget, and then they disperse those contracts. Um, that lives in a different data source <laughs> than our spending data. So the way that the 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 DSS would spend its contract budget would then live in a different data source, and that's how um, like human services are all contract mostly contracted out to nonprofits or now increasingly for profits. So we've been asked by our members who are dealing with um, specifically contract issues because that's how they they get their money from the city through contracts, not through you know this. Uh, expenditure and that has there's been a lot of problems with the actual data source of um, they're moving all this data into passport NYC and there's been some issues pulling that um, so that is why it's not currently in involved um, but that's part of the conversation is finding those missing data points and why it's hard for um, to display to advocates so actually yeah <laughs> Yeah, um, can you talk a little bit more about um, FCWA, why it was founded, who's part of your membership, and yeah. why you become a member? Yeah, um, so we were founded over 100 years ago. It goes back to the time where social services and supports were um, pretty much provided based on your religion, and um, there was a gap in New York City, I think, for especially uh, black people, people of color, um, that weren't receiving support through other, you know, religious organizations. And so FPWA sort of built around that. Um, over time, uh, FPWA's focus is like, we're now, um, 
you know, work with agencies and organizations of different religions. It's not really focused purely on um, Protestant organizations. Um, in terms of our membership, um, you know, we have, it's primarily um, community-based organizations. So, um, you know, some religious groups and churches, other um, community-based organizations that are running social services programs. Um, and yeah, like if you're organized, it's the members are all um, organizations really. Um, but there's like information on our website for um, becoming a member um, if your organization is interested. Um, no. Um, <laughs> I think we do have like more time if we want to, but I think um, there's we are this ongoing conversation of this is an iterative product and where we can what's the most valuable information that can be added to the funds tracker so if anyone here is you know at, is an advocate and has these you know research questions that they'd like to ask i think that's something that we're you know hoping to get as input as we decide where to move next um I actually have a question about like, the advocacy process in general. What's the process for you guys? What do you do to advocate? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, there's like a, you know, a lot of different ways maybe. One of the main ones um, is like through coalitions that we're a part of and leading. So other um, organizations, we come together to sort of build a, a bigger and more powerful voice and then use that to reach out directly to elected um, officials. Um, at the moment, one of the main things we're doing um, there's preliminary budget hearings at the moment, so we're attending those, um, submitting testimony, to and you know using the data that we have in the tracker as part of our evidence base to make the case for why, um, you know, certain programs need to be funded, um, and then we also do, I guess, some broader advocacy where we're doing um, some longer-term research projects where it's more just to put these things out into the world to like shape the discourse in a way that, um, you know, highlights the benefits of um, particular programs or, you know, trying to change the narrative around um, a lot of like the economic justice issues in the city today. Um, I was just going to say your question, I do think looking at looking at things like TANA and where the money is being allocated outside of their cash systems. I think and like looking at yeah. a trend like that over yeah. time, it's, I know that there's been work on that in other states. I think like CBP, like other yeah. places have. Yeah. Um, so to the extent it's, you think it's new or interesting or relevant, you think that is, it's a good way of tracking where some of this grant money um, is, is in Yeah, yeah. I'm not, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if you've seen that John Oliver, um, there's like a John Oliver video that you should all look up afterwards and it's him talking about TANF and some of the things that the funding for TANF is spent on is just crazy and like mm. not at all related to like, you know, um, helping people. Um, yeah, and I think for and for TAM funding, like if you want to connect it to that advocacy question of where we're doing there is we're part of this cash assistance reform network and those are there's a number of bills in the current session that our organization is um, has is supporting and doing lobbying work to try to change um, a lot of the way that it's being allocated by our state. So I think there's like, if you get into it, I, I don't know if everyone's like super into TAM funding, but I think um, like looking at some of these changes, like, you know, we can see some of the ways that it might be effective or what needs to be changed in order to provide effective benefits. So we see that essentially like, you know, part of it is there was a formula change in how much like the city has to support um, in funding. And so that you can see that like it, it jumps upwards um, and then you where like federal government has to support a lot more. Um, but then you see a erosion of this funding 
Um, and I think this gets to the last, the point that you brought up with like where it's being spent. So TAMP funding, it's not just, it's to, it's a complete benefits program. It was in initially intended to be um, cash assistance and then, but it could be used for different, um, different ways to support essentially families um, and to get people to start working. And so it had a really broad framework that it's been able to be leveraged by state governments to fund like other programs that aren't about essentially temporary assistance to people that need have like the most need and essentially it's already started to be used as sort of like a rainy day fund for state funding where they have they have basically reserves of uh they don't have to spend all their TAN funding every year and they know that this funding can be used to um support other non-cash assistance programs for example pre-k 3k new york state uses a, a large portion of TAM funding to support that work. So they're both holding back that funding and not spending it every year when they have it available. And then they're spending it on more systemic, systemic or uh, less temporary assistance measures. Um, so it's, it's really this interplay of like state politics and um, are, that's why it's like in, important to look at like the sustainability of budget in general, like we can get into this detail view, but it's we're really like it, you need to connect it to that larger budget story of revenue. Like how are how does the state um, how is the state getting its money, and how can it, it move these levers to fund different um, different programs in totality? Yeah, that's a little, but. Um, um, I really appreciated how this slide had some explanation about each of these inflection points. Because um, sometimes we see graphs and things happen and there's no context for that. I'm interested if you could share a little bit about that. I felt maybe each story has its own thing, but like if you came to a graph and it had some movement and you wanted to find out why, where are the places that your team typically looks to contextualize the reason for a change? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where um, it's, we, you have to go outside of the tracker. Um, we have been informed by, you know, members, like talking to people is in the, you know, networking here is useful, but you'll find that for TAMF, there is a lot of information that you can easily like access um, through the internet by just by doing your own research. Um, you know, going to other, going to sites like FPWA that have already done analysis um, and other organizations like ours that will support that kind of research. Um, you can also, though, like, for example, if you have specific grant funding and you see major changes in that, in that grant, you might not have, this is like the largest, um, this is the largest poverty, like a benefit assistance program. For some of these smaller ones, you might not know why that's happening. And that's when you st have to start doing your, your advocacy, start calling up your representative, you know, start reaching out to people and making it an, an issue um, that people can tell you why things have changed. Do you get a sense of like, or do you know, um, like for these federal funding programs, like, do they typically go to the states and do like states that have gone to cities, or does it go, or I guess like for DFS, does it come directly from a federal grant, or is it like federal grant being distributed through the state? It depends. Yeah, yeah, it depends on the program. Like yeah. what we have in the tracker are the um, grants that are going directly to the city, yeah. but then and it also, um, you know, sort of like we were saying earlier, some of the grants the um, state receives will have like, you know, varying levels of stipulation about what they need to spend on. Um, and then that sort of informs like, whether it's like, does pass through directly to the city or, um, you know, held back um, used for specific things. Um, but yeah, there is. Advocacy, how do you guys 
Uh huh. Yeah. So it's a yeah. Yeah. Well, um, that cash assistance reform network that um, Emily mentioned. So that's a um, a network that FPWA is co-leading, and one of the projects we're doing through that at the moment is really around like narrative change. And what we're doing in that is we're um, doing an interview series where we're talking to people that have um, that are recipients of cash assistance. So that quote that we had on the slide there, that was from one of these interviews that we did with people. Um, and we're going to be, you know, releasing that research this year so you can watch, um, watch this space. I think what we're trying to counter the narrative around is, um, you know, some of the things that Emily touched on around like, oh, people are spending their money on this or that, or like, you know, people, you know, are just like not, are just choosing not to work. And what we're trying to show is like, when you actually talk to people, the reality is like, you know, everyone's lives are far more complex than just like, they're choosing to just um, not work. And I think by like, showing that more human side, like combining that with the data is like how you can sort of make a stronger um, advocacy case. Yeah, and then we just see like, that's why we've looked at this human services funding generally because um, you know a lot of times it's it doesn't get the attention that it deserves in budget conversations because people think about human services as a cost and we really think about it as this as a the uh, integral part of the social network and social ca capital of the city um, and so it's continually you know de defunded is um, Mm -hmm. is is how we get to now and how we get to um uh poverty you know in uh, sustaining cycles of poverty um in the city yeah we work with the uh, 75 schools the schools that work with um, children with disabilities and, um, autism, dyslexia. yeah i think so i think to the extent that um, I know we do work with some CBOs that work in that space. I'm not sure if they are specifically um, running those schools. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not uh, an area that I work in. But I, I'd imagine we um, would have members that are working in that space. But it would be um, like our colleagues that work on the membership team would be able to answer more. But sorry, I don't <laughs> I think we're at time. So thank you all. <laughs>